What is up, martial arts fanatics? Welcome back. As always, I am Coach Greg, and this month you guys voted for Ilya Taporia. I am very excited to be doing a, an Ilya Taporia breakdown. Uh, he has a great system that he uses with amazing boxing, and the fact that he has a history in Greco-Roman wrestling and a black belt in jiu-jitsu, it makes him a very dangerous guy. This is a guy that, man, he runs through people. Now, it's a little bit on the early side to be doing a system breakdown because he only has five fights in the UFC so far. Now he's 14 and 0, and yes, I went back and watched his fights before the UFC, but I don't count those with the same amount that I count the fights that he had in the UFC, to be totally honest. And that's just because things change. It's a much higher level, so guys evolve their game when they hit there. However, what he has done has been consistent across the board. So I think it's safe at this point to do a system breakdown. Also, you guys voted for it, so this is what you get. Um, but he is an amazing case study. I'm really excited to be breaking him down. So stay tuned and let's get into Ilya Taporia. Real quick, before we move on, I want to take a quick second to encourage you to go check out the Nemean Fight System. It's available on Dynamic Striking and BJJ Fanatics. It's a three-hour masterclass you're not going to want to miss. It guarantees results because it's all things that are pressure tested and done at the highest level. And I can point to case studies to prove it. Now, in addition to that, we offer it as a book format available on Amazon. And if you are a martial artist, this is a book you're going to want to have in your library. So please go check it out. Thanks, guys. Okay, so we're gonna spend most of our time today talking about his boxing. And it's not that he doesn't have amazing grappling, obviously he does, but it's such a huge topic to cover sometimes that I don't feel like I can get as in depth as I would like. And more importantly, there are certain tactics that he uses that he keeps going back to to make himself successful. And those are the things I wanna focus on when we talk about his grappling and what has allowed his wrestling and grappling to be so successful in the ring. And to be honest, he filters it down to just a couple things anyway. So. That's the main reason that we're going to spend most of our time talking about his boxing today. Okay, so before we talk about how he puts hands on people, let's talk about what he does to make himself safe so that he feels confident to get in there and throw hands. Because a lot of it is, you know, when you're boxing or any type of striking, the way to be most confident to throw your big shots is to know that you can't get hit. And this is something Ilya Taporia is excellent at. And he's not doing anything crazy out of the norm. What he's using is good boxing. That's really all it is. So as he enters in, you know, he does a lot of step. We talked about the step entry a lot of time to draw out their attacks, make them swing and miss, or to make them miss so that he can counter off of it. But he also does a lot of anytime he enters range, active head movement whenever he enters range, so that as they throw, he's already halfway into a slip and he can throw a shot off of that. Very common kind of tactic, right? He also does a lot of disengaging, especially as he enters in. If they come at him, he's happy to disengage, blocking and disengaging, moving his head as he enters, right? Once again, like we talked about before, Shavkat Rachmanov, Arlev, picking his moment as they throw to be able to start to counter, to pick his slips and when to uh, use those. And since he's already moving his head, it's easy to find that timing. One of the things you're gonna see him do a lot is he likes to drop his head to the right, very similar to what you see out of a Philly shell. Play from the orthodox, very common to drop his head under the punches, because now all he's gotta worry about is that left hook and left uppercut, which is usually a little bit harder for guys to throw in the moment, right? A lot of times, most of their attacks, especially against somebody like Josh Emmett, Josh Emmett, Pretty much all he throws is a jab cross. So it makes it kind of easy to beat a guy like that when you can just keep coming underneath it. And that's the type of stuff Ilya Taporia is excellent at. Being his head off the line, dropping down, stepping to draw out attacks, and using that to set up easy entry. So that when he does enter into range, he knows that they're not ready to attack him because he's given the opportunity to throw at him. They haven't taken it, so now he can engage. There are a couple of attacks that he does in particular that I find really nice. And he seems to keep going back to them over and over again because they keep working. So obviously a lot of what he does is built off of the jab coming in here and just timing it, putting hands out. He's so good at knowing his timing on it, letting them not take the opportunity to hit him and then coming forward, looking for the opportunity for the hands to drop. If they don't, he's more than content to drop and hit that body shot. Um, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But a lot of this comes from building off of the jab. Then from here, what you're going to see a lot of times is him throwing this right hand. And it's not just a cross, it's an overhand, but it's a very specific use of it. And what he's trying to do is get them to defend by putting weight on the back leg, whether they're here or here, whatever they're doing. Inevitably, the response is putting weight on the back, on the back leg, especially because he's pressured them back to the black line. So it's not like they can just disengage, right? 
they're there. He's not gonna let them run away. So now that he's backed him up, now he's gonna put the right hand. And as they start to back up and put weight on their back leg rather, like so, when this starts to happen, then he attacks the body. It leaves them very open for the body shot, right? As they're putting weight back here, they're very exposed. And then inevitably what happens, as they start defending the body, bam! That's when he gets them. That's what he's looking to set up. Almost everything he does is looking to set up this big, powerful right. So once again, he's gonna come in here, right? Not letting them catch him, right? If they try to come at him, he disengages, backs him up, hits the jab because he knows that they're not gonna engage. So if they're not gonna try to catch him, there's nothing to stop him from going forward. Then he comes in, he goes, he goes for the cross, right? And when he does, they start to back up. Pop, pop. And all he's trying to do is get them to put weight on that back foot here and then expose this. And then when they come down, being really open for that overhand right. And he hits this all the time. The other thing that he does a lot is as he comes in here, he starts dropping in this jab to the body, right? And then when they start to defend it, he faints and he goes and puts the right out. He does this stuff over and over to people and it works. And it's really, these are the two primary tactics he keeps going back to. He enters in, throws the jab, comes in here, throws the right, gets him to put weight on the back leg, pop, pop, puts the right on. Comes in here, they start to defend the high, comes to the body, comes to the body, he faints, and he hits the right hand. These are the tactics that he is consistently able to hit. Another thing that he does a lot as he enters in is if he doesn't feel like the jab is there because they're defending for whatever reason, it's calf kicks all day long, right? And this is how he level changes. So he comes in here, right? Pulls it out of them. If they're still defending high, he doesn't feel like he can hit the body. He hits that low calf kick. Then he starts coming in and setting up his jabs, right? Thanks to the body shot to get here, coming here. And that's how he puts heavy hats out. But that calf kick makes for a nice level change as he enters in, right? He feels like he wants to get the jab, he can't get it. And he throws the leg. With counters, he has some really nice go-tos. Uh, probably the one that he is the best at is like I said, he does a lot of this stepping in to draw punches. And as they come forward with a jab, he just comes overhand with the right. This is something he consistently can get to is getting them overcommitted, chasing them. And while they're here, bam, catching them as they move in. Uh, he did this a bunch to Josh on it. Another thing that he does a lot is we already talked about how he likes to come into this sequence here. A lot of times as he starts to go for it, if they start to counter in the middle, you'll see him draw back and throw this hook because he knows that they're moving forward on him, right? Usually as he's here, they're not gonna stay in place. They're gonna come forward to try to catch their jab cross or whatever they're gonna hit. So as he comes in, he draws back to throw this hook. That is, a, that is something he hits a lot as well. Um, he keeps going back to the right. So he's hitting the jab from the outside. It's usually, he usually throws it as a combination to like if he's in mid combination and they start to throw, right? This is when he gets up, right? Because he's attacking the middle of a combination, this is his default to fall back to. It's like a fall background. So where the first one is like drawing it out, the second one is like, okay, I'm gonna engage, then I'm gonna engage in a combination and catch you as you start to counter in the middle of my combination, which is a common thing. Um, another thing that he does, like I said, is he'll drop his head and come down, come up with an uppercut. That's something he likes to hit a lot. Uh, because like I said, especially in MMA, the most thrown attack is a jab cross because range forces them to have to cover ground. So straight punching becomes better. He knows this. And since a lot of guys don't attack the body, you know, he knows that the majority of the time, what he can expect is guys going uh, head hunting. So he can come underneath and hit here. And then finally, if he starts to come in and he ends up in a scramble, you will start to see him doing things like here, right? These short little choppy punches and holding his ground and just being willing to exchange on him and put hands on him by throwing. And it's usually some version of like a three, two, five, two that he likes to do back to him. Uh, those are really the big combination or counters that you generally tend to see out of. One thing I wanna mention that he does that I find uh, very successful for him is that whenever he gets clipped, he immediately is coming up to hit a double leg. There is no hesitation. This is pre-programmed. So if he's fighting and he gets knocked down, he's immediately coming up, getting a double head, getting a double leg and driving him back all the way to the cage. Anytime he hits a double leg, that is what he's going to do is put them back against the cage. But the time he seems most prone to do it is just if he gets clipped, 
or if somebody happens to take him down, he comes up with it and he has very, uh, he, he has a good drive where he doesn't quit. He keeps after it, keeps after it, keeps after it. And I think that's a big part of his success is that he just doesn't give up on it. He never stops pushing into it. There's no quit. And that's that wrestler mentality of just never giving up. What I find interesting is when he does get guys against the cage. Now, he does do a lot of like dirty boxing and stuff like that too, but he seems to mostly be focused on the double leg. And what I find interesting about his game is that he'll get to a double under sometimes and not try to go for like trips and stuff like that. And instead from the double unders, he'll use this to kind of back him up and stuff, but he uses this inevitably to drop down and get under the legs. He doesn't really care about upper body takedowns. He's really focused on the leg takedowns. Uh, now there's some exceptions. We're gonna talk about that in a minute, but most of the time what he's looking to do is as he's working here, he'll throw some dirty boxing and then he comes down to get the legs. And he's really big on lifting guys up to get his takedown. That is his style. I personally, look, I, I'm an older guy. I'm 43. I'm not trying to spend that much effort. Like, I want to just trip them and be done, right? But not him. He's trying to lift them up and then put them on the ground. He likes the lifting style takedowns against the cage. Um, and then the other one that he's hit before is from a double unders. And this one was cool. Was, oh, excuse me. He got to an under over on this. And he did that suplex coming back over the top here. It was like a lat drop suplex. That was cool, right? Very showy, takes a lot of energy because he wasn't just falling back with it. Like he got to here and he lifted him up, popped his hips forward and then came over the top. Uh, it just shows how strong that guy is. But he knows he can hit these against guys. So, you know, if you know you can do it, do it. That energy payoff is worth it. If you have the energy pool to be able to do it. And if you know you can do it, sure, do it. Get on top, right? Um, and that seems to be his go-to when it comes to takedowns is he doesn't do a lot of takedowns, which is surprising considering his wrestling background. He mostly is focused. He wants to box guys, but if he does end up in a situation here where he gets them, and especially if like he gets to a double unders, you know, guys like me, I like to do a lot of getting behind the knee and stuff like that here. Um, you know, I'm not going to get into a whole attack against the wall thing, but, um, he likes to, from here, really try to work down bow to get under those legs and start hitting double leg attacks, especially lifting. Lastly, I want to finish with how he uses his defensive wrestling, the sprawl, to get to a north-south headlock position and use that to finish guys. He has a very great, his guillotine and his anaconda are fantastic, but it usually occurs off of a good sprawl or working to that position. Most of the time, what happens is he's very quick to hit the sprawl from the outside. I mean, he's just on the spot. A lot of it comes from the way that he strikes where, you know, he punches it outside and disengages. And as they come in, right, he's ready to be on top of them. And when he does, he consistently lands over the head and over the arm. So he's already thinking about sprawling to a position where he can be successful. From here, it's just a matter of as they come up, getting to that arm and guillotine position, compressing the head, sitting back and finishing from there. Very, very high success rate. One of the best guillotines in the USC, in my opinion, like very, very uh, efficient with it. And what I like is that not a lot of guys attack the Anaconda, but he does. As he starts getting on top of him here, he'll punch this arm through and start coming through and getting to his Anaconda choke, finishing. Once again, very lethal with these techniques. Once he gets them cinched, he finishes guys. And often it's because it's a combination of having a nice setup, being very technical and being very strong from there and knowing that, you know, their best escape is to try to pop their head out. He just doesn't allow it. He's very good at compressing that head down with the elbow pinch and curving their back to really create that chin compression. Finishes them very, very well from there. That is the majority of his submission game, but he's caught a bunch of people with that. Now, he does have some, you know, good jujitsu on top, but mostly he tends to prefer to stay standing. So he'll throw some shots on top and then get back, or he'll end up on the ground. Like, you know, he's been taken down, like Bryce Mitchell took him down. And he'll do stuff like, you know, he'll control in here and just kind of like wait till he can get back to his feet if possible, or till the round ends if it's the end of the round. But from here, you know, if he does, you know, you'll see him do this kind of stuff, getting back to that headlock position as he starts to get up and starting to control in here and doing this kind of stuff where he can start now swimming for that. Uh, but overall, very, very nice use of that headlock position. And personally, I like this position a lot anyway, 
because it's exhausting for guys, right? I like to make them carry my weight a lot anyway, um, really wear them out. But for him, he's being offensive with it. He's not just making him carry his weight. He's really going for stuff off of it. And man, that guillotine finish is lethal. Okay, guys, so I want to finish by talking about areas of improvement. This is not a criticism of him. What's not even the slightest. He's an elite level fighter. I'm just me. Uh, what I'm talking about is if you are going to implement this kind of a system in your game, here's some things that I would do if I were fighting somebody like him. And I'm not saying he doesn't have these skills. He's just untested in them in the UFC. He might very well have solutions for these things. I'm saying that we haven't seen it in the UFC because he hasn't been confronted with it. So these are things that if I had to fight Ilya Teporia, what would I do? And then we'll talk about what, if somebody was doing that back to me, what I would do if I were Ilya Teporia. And I'm just saying this so that if you're gonna play this kind of system, these are things you need to be aware of for obstacles and solutions for that. So first of all, job number one, don't get put behind the black line. Whether that involves just changing an angle here, right? <laughs> right? Something as simple as that could do it as you get backed up. But for me, I like to do like we talked about in the Michael Bisping, just disconnect and reset. Never letting myself get backed up. Um, we talk about like Sean Strickland versus Izzy. That's the contest, right? is he let himself get backed up too much. You have to just reset, reset, reset until you get there. And if they start chasing you, you have to be able to put things on them. Particularly, I like lateral techniques. So as I start coming and they start chasing, I start hitting lateral techniques and making them pay the price for it, right? So as I start circling up, just keep catching up with lateral techniques every time they come at you. Stuffing them, stuffing them, stuffing them over and over again. And it can be midsection, it can be five, whatever it is. That type of stuff works really well. If you do get behind the black line, I would do something very similar like an Alex Pereira solution. Hands up here, and then I chop away at the legs. He takes a very deep stance. He leans heavy on the front leg, and he steps deep when he punches. For me, that's an opportunity. Calf kick, calf kick, calf. Just all the time. But no, he's gonna throw it back. So I have to be better at that game than him. The only thing I would do we already talked about lateral techniques. I would do something to hit something on the head drop and lure that out. So I throw the jab and he starts to drop his head. I faint the jab and I call it my knee strike. I try to set that up and that's a chess match, right? And then if he starts to do something like disengage, right? And starts to go put weight on the back leg, maybe I faint the jab, faint that, and then come over the top. This is where you start setting things up and it's wheels within wheels. You start going counter to counter to counter. For Ilya Teporia, if you're playing that side of the game, what do you do about this stuff? First of all, if a guy is running a lot, you have to do good cutting off ring space, being parallel to the cage, but you can't allow yourself to get stuffed. And ultimately, it might involve abandoning that game and having a backup game. If that guy, you know, if I'm putting an annoying little jerk like me, who's just gonna circle out and reset, and I keep trying to cut off ring space, and then they're gone. <sighs> It's hard to keep them behind the black line and you end up playing their game where they lure you in. That's what I do. And so for guys like that, one, you just have to stay on top of them, never giving them space. But then ultimately, if that doesn't work, you have to switch gears and lure them into a counter game and just go, oh, okay, come to me. Let them come to you. And then start luring their techniques out and putting hands on them heavy and making them pay the price for that kind of an outside game. Uh, as far as the leg kicking game, you know, the best solution for that is just have good leg defense. No matter what it is, for me, I play a very Wonder Boy style. My front foot steps back and then I come down with the cross. Um, but it could be something as simple like when we talked about the Jose Aldo breakdown with passively being aware and just pop, very quick to check, right? Pop. Never giving them an opportunity to be successful on that because you're so good at checking. And that's a skill you have to develop. And I haven't seen any footage of Ilya Teporio really working that kind of stuff, which makes me think that might be a weakness in his game. Volkanovski's gonna put it to the test for sure. Now, uh, finally, as far as like the head drop, you know, you kinda, he might be doing that just because he's getting guys like Josh Emmett who are just throwing jab cross at him. You know, somebody else, it might be a different look. If he gets somebody who's worried about the knee, he might not go to that, right? Or if he does, just disconnect right? Not staying there where you can get hit in the face or just being aware of it and being disciplined as I come in here so that I always have a boundary in place and I'm not leaving myself open to it. It could be as simple as that. But these are just some things to think about. I hope you like this breakdown. Make sure you share it with your friends, guys.